His butler was explaining things to him, but everything just sounded vague. When he was advised to go and see the madam to help him regain his memories, he vehemently rejected the idea. He summoned for the other woman who was staying within his property in another house instead. Rosalind was ecstatic as she faced a salon. She thwarted the facts as much as she can and brazenly claimed they were lovers. When the Duke asked his butler of the legitimacy of her claims, the butler honestly told him that he was not privy to the actual details. All he knew is that the Duke banished Rosalind for disregarding his feelings and telling lies to his wife, whom he regarded as the most important thing in his life. The Duke bluntly pointed out that said wife left his side on her own. Still undecided, the Duke requested Rosalind to stay with him for the time being, as he tried to regain his lost memories. Rosalind was beyond herself from the happiness she was feeling that moment. Meanwhile at the Violet House, Leela recovered from her cold and was sipping tea when Hans, the postman, arrived with the daily newspaper. There has been an accident in the capital. Having a bad feeling, she reached for the Daily Post and read the news. Duke Aslan Thordal suffered severe injury after a carriage ran him over. Fear and worry filled her very being and she longed to see him and inquire about his health. Seeing her plight, her family voiced out their support and urged her to see him. Meanwhile, in the Duke's manner, Rosalind was doing all her best to brainwash the Duke into believing they were actually a couple, and continued on with her fake stories. The Duke wasn't actually convinced. If he's to be honest with himself, Rosalind isn't his type, he would rather have the woman from his dream who exudes a certain air of purity and simplicity, since he is still processing his situation and making adjustments with his elusive memories, he let her talk. That was until Dalton came and made his usual daily reports. Among them was the gossip going around his fellow nobles. They were actually thinking that his accident was because he was devastated over his wife who left the manor and their looming divorce. Worried that question about his mental state might arise, which can greatly affect the Thordal stocks in a negative way, he contemplated what can he do to stop the gossips. Rosalind saw an opportunity to solidify her position as the next duchess. She suggested they walk around town, whilst making it seem like an intimate date. The Duke saw the potential in her suggestion and agreed. Unbeknownst to them, Leela is already at the capital and was nearby. Her father, out of fear that she might get kidnapped again, escorted her incognito as her porter. As they were about to head to the Thordal Manor, she saw Aslan and Rosalind in walking closely together. Little did she know it was all for show. Rosalind saw her ride across them and deliberately tripped, making excuses to the Duke that the new shoes she's wearing are not fitting correctly, and she finds it hard to walk. The Duke carried her bridal style, with the purpose of driving away the rumors still in his mind. Leela witnessed it all. She felt exasperation and pity towards herself for still feeling hurt. She had no right to feel that way. Their contract already ended. She pulled her father away from the scene before he can even see it, and started walking away. However, Somebody called out to her. It was her personal maid at the manor, Jenna. She's begging her to come back. The situation just turned serious. Puzzled by Jenna's utterance, she asked her why. The maid told her everything, including the reason for their master's accident. Worry, love, and guilt flooded her. Leela decided to finally see the Duke. Meanwhile, the Duke was contemplating over things. The moment he carried Rosalind, the memories of someone he once used to carry in his arms entered his mind. She was lighter than Rosalind. The name Helena Lairstein persistently appears in his fragmented memory. His footman and runner announced the Duchess' arrival and he granted her audience. As she walks towards the Grand Hall memories came in waves. The dreams, the reality, and the fragmented memories overlap each other. He paled with the ridiculousness of his situation. But above all that, one emotion kept coming up front. It's as if he is in love with her. Whatever he was experiencing now, he never experienced it with Rosalind. He questioned his relationship with this lady in front of him. What's worse is that he can't bear to be near her. Not because he abhors her presence. It's quite the contrary. All he can think of is he wants to hold her in his arms and kiss her. Desire, conflicting emotions, 
and waves of memories are making it hard to breathe. He covered it up by accusing her of taking advantage of their marriage and exploiting his good graces. Seeing her tears only made him feel worse. It's as if his own heart is breaking. Rosalind entered the scene and seeing how the Duchess' presence is affecting Aslan, and out of fear that his memories might come back, she drove her away, calling her a shameless woman for coming back even when their contract marriage is already over. Leela left the manor, determined never to show her face ever again. As she met with her father, she showed him a smile amidst the looming tears in her eyes, faking a cheery attitude. She beckoned him to accompany her and choose gifts for her mother and brother. Meanwhile at the Thordal Manor, the Duke came down with a fever. After seeing his wife that day, unknown memories came to his mind. He questioned the looming happiness he felt as his mind is filled with memories he knows nothing of. Never had he imagined that he could be happy with someone, ever since his mother went mad. They were what people call battered wife and son. His father would beat him up, and his mother would intervene and get beaten up herself, worse than him. When he was old enough, he carried out his long-waited plan of killing his own father to stop his mother's suffering. Unfortunately, his father discovered it and almost killed him. It was his mother who gave him the killing blow. She stabbed him with a dagger. She lost her mind afterwards and stopped recognizing him. In her eyes, he who looks so much his father was the very man she despises and fear at the same time. Every time she sees him, her own son, she goes ballistic and becomes uncontrollable. From then on, he stopped caring about women right after he covered up his mother's crime of murdering his father and sending her off to the monastery. The woman who exploited him and blackmailed him is the very woman who makes him feel happy. Meanwhile, as the Duke sleeps, Rosalind was anxiously asking the doctor about Aslan's welfare, not because she's genuinely worried about him, but because she fears he might regain his memories back. The Duke was dreaming again. This time he saw himself and the woman called Helena Lairstein in a monastery where his mother lay lifeless in her coffin. The lady was crying bitterly than he is. In his eyes, she is not gorgeous but she is elegant. She looks beautiful even in mourning clothes. He wanted her. He coveted her. He desired her and longed for her love. He was able to marry her but in a different way. She blackmailed him, and they got married in a monastery where his mother spent the rest of her days until she perished. His love got twisted. He loves her so but resents her at the same time. When she begged him to love her just once, he felt happy. He chose to hurt her by choosing Rosalind. Unable to bear the pain, Helena left him. It broke his heart, and he committed suicide. As he was falling down the cliff, he woke up with a start on his bed, drenched in sweat. Rosalind was there to wipe him down and was about to call for a doctor when the Duke grabbed her wrist and pulled her to him. Foolishly believing his dreams as reality, he let himself be consumed with rage towards his ex-wife. He proposed to Rosalind and promised to marry her as soon as his divorce papers were signed. Rosalind was, of course, happy. She finally won and had the Duke. Morning came. News of the Duke's new marriage reached far and wide. Even the train that Leela and her father were currently boarding, Leela accepted it as fate and surrendered herself to the original course of the novel which she believes as something she cannot oppose no matter what she does. At the Thordal Manor, Aslan summoned Dalton, his butler come retainer, and ordered him to expedite the divorce proceedings and prepare for a wedding. Dalton, being the loyal servant that he was, tried reasoning out to his master and plead him to rethink his decision. The Duke bluntly put the butler in his place and openly rejected any opposition that may come from him. Helpless, the butler acceded to his master's decision and asked him where he wanted the wedding. The Duke inquired, where was the previous marriage took place? Much to his surprise it was held at the Grand Cathedral and not on a monastery. His mother still lives and their manor just received news that his mother is getting weaker, but is still alive. Shocked registered on his face. What an utter fool he was. How can he mix memories of reality to his vivid dreams? Realizing his mistake, he ordered Dalton to stop all wedding preparations. The next day, 
As Aslan was contemplating on his actions and the things he ought to do, Rosalind visited his study and inquired on the halt he imposed on the wedding preparations. He told her he needed to check on things to make sure he doesn't make a hasty decision. He then proceeded to ask Rosalind if he truly said out loud that he is annoyed by his contract marriage with his ex-wife. Rosalind blatantly lied and said yes. Wanting to get in his good graces, Rosalind talked about Aslan's mother in the monastery, making one obvious mistake. She said his mother was getting better, when in fact, ever since his mother entered the monastery, her health never improved. Remembering his mother's condition made him recall a memory he shared with Helena. Secretly, he would read the letters of the monastery in the garden, away from prying years. But Helena found him one day. She casually inquired if it was from the monastery. Not wanting to disclose his mother's condition, he lied about the letter said it was from his mother, congratulating them on their marriage. She gave him an understanding smile and held his hand. Instead of threatening him and using his secret to blackmail him, she told him that she'll pray for them both, mother and son. From that, he made up his mind. He'll meet his ex-wife, despite Rosalind's attempt to stop him, he rang for his butler and ordered him to buy him a train ticket to a load. As a last ditch to make him stay, Rosalind clung to him and reminded him that he got sick right after he met his ex-wife. It would be best to take plenty of rest before traveling far. He intercepted her by saying that when he's with her, no memories, no emotion comes. He feels calm and at ease. He is certain that he never loved her. He ordered his butler to send Rosalind to the Amber House once again. He is still uncertain which of the memories and the scenes from his dreams are his actual memories, but he is sure that the things filled his mind as of late are because of Helena Leerstein. Plagued with longing for the men she loves and the desire to suppress such thoughts, Leela stayed up until snow fell from the sky. Her parents, after giving her their morning greetings, were contemplating as to what happened when father and daughter went to the capital to see the duke. All they know for certain is that it's a big misunderstanding between them. Alone in her bedroom, Leela determinedly swore to herself that never again shall she foolishly hope of being loved by a slan Thordle. Said man just arrived at the train station of the town. He was surprised how well maintained the station is and the facilities are clean. His companion explained that he himself ordered the development of the rural area. Wondering why would he order such a thing, he mused that it must also be because of her. Meanwhile, at the Violets, Leela decided to spend her time in embroidery. Accidentally, she pricked her finger with the needle and memories of a slan worrying over her came rushing in. She admonished herself for foolishly thinking of him. A shout from her bedroom door broke her reverie. It was Aaron, beckoning her to come downstairs. Wondering why, she relented and went down, only to be surprised. Lo and behold, it was a slant thordle in the flesh, standing there before her very eyes. Stunned at his sudden appearance in their home, all she could mutter was ask him what he was doing there as she slowly descended the stairs. Halfway though, he rushed to her without answering and inquired if she's hurt. Instead, wondering why he's asking her that, she absent-mindedly stared at her finger and saw its bloodied state. As she looked up again, she discovered that he crossed her personal space, seeing him up close, after a long time, made her weak in the knees and she almost fell had he not caught her in his arms. He apologized for the intimate contact and explained that his body moved on its own. His mind might have forgotten, but his body remembered it well that he used to catch her whenever she fell. The spectators downstairs just stared at them. They looked like they're in the mood for something unspoken. The Duke asked for a first aid kit and treated her finger, asking her about their relationship and why she left him when he's done with the bandagging. She told him the truth. Theirs was a contract marriage and it stayed that way. She left him because the contract is over and he has someone he truly loves. She caught him staring at her, but it didn't faze him. He commented that she looked thinner than when he last saw her instead. Is she sick? Is there something wrong with her health? Is she eating properly? Or isn't she getting enough sleep? His questions that sounded genuinely sincere evoked emotions in her she dared not welcome. She was assuring him she's fine when all of a sudden 
She coughed. The duke left his seat and gave her a warm drink, stating that he clearly remembers that his wife is sickly, that as the air gets colder, she would be cooped in bed and coughing. Just by simply being with her, memories easily came to him. He kneeled on one knee and begged her to let him stay with her under the same roof while he regains all of his memories. Meanwhile at the Amber House, Rosalind was left all alone by the servants. She takes care of all her needs, Left with no money, she's thinking if she should sell some of her clothes to earn funds for her food and firewood. She was such in a predicament when Glock appeared right in front of her. Back in the load, after a hearty homemade meal by the Violets, the Duke was given a tour in their small home by none other than Leela. Staying in her room to talk, the Duke was surprised to know her past circumstances and how they ended up married. Seeing that there was nothing for him to gain with their contract union, he came up with the conclusion that he must have been very much in love with her. Not wanting to get swayed, she denied the possibility of what he was saying. He was in love with Rosalind and not her. He even went as far as say that the marriage was a nuisance. The Duke then asked her if she ever told him she loved him. Or if he told her he is in love with her, she honestly told him the truth. No. They never shared an intimate moment on the same bed. Leela then told the Duke that she believes his memory loss is hindering his judgment and reasoning. When the time comes that he regains all his memories, he'll see that everything is just a misunderstanding. However, it did not phase the Duke from deciding that he needs to get closer to her in order to regain all his memories. Two days have passed, and the Duke was able to help with their house chores as if he's been living there for a very long time. As she accompanies him to chop firewood, his retainer came giving him a change of clothes. Leela admonished him for staying at their house. Rosalind must be worried with his decision to stay for an extended time at his ex-wife's house. He corrected her, they were still legally married. When she gave him a doubtful stare, he told her that at some point he tore the contract and divorce papers seem like he doesn't want to end their marriage. Disbelief filled her face. She doesn't want to believe it, even when she saw he still wore their wedding ring. Even when they were still living as contract couple in the Thordle Manor, there was never a day that Aslan Thordle didn't wear his wedding ring. However, the rumor she heard in the train bothered her. According to rumors, the inside of the wedding band of the Duke bears the name of the one he truly loves. Her name was akin to a flower. Wanting to contradict his beliefs that he was in love with her, during their three years of married life, she voiced out her concern. Without hesitation, he took off his ring, beckoning her to come see for herself. Filled with pity for herself, she snapped at him and said that she need not see with her own eyes that it was Rosalind's name. The Duke laughed at her and showed her nonetheless. Leela was inscribed in his ring, her real name. No doubt that she is the only girl he ever loved, and nothing can stop him from doing everything he can to win her heed back, until she love him with the same level of passion he does. Meanwhile, at the Amber House, Glock was once again manipulating Rosalind into believing that he loves her and that selling all her jewelries and clothes would pave the way for greater things they can accomplish. Back at the Volets, the Duke was helping with field work. When I den, Leela's brother came with apple pie sprinkled with cinnamon. As I den addressed him by his title, he asked him to call him a slon. Left by themselves surrounded by trees, Aslan offered the pie to Leela. She thought he must have really lost his memories. She never liked foods with strong scents. That's why he always keeps strong scented food away from her. As she was about to reach for the pie, he moved it away from her. He explained that he remembers her food preferences. Hopeful that he already regained his memories, she asked him about it. But all he said was it was on reflex. He never remembers people's name that got no bearing in his business. Least of all their preferences or personal details, if she's not keeping any kind of hidden wealth, then it must mean he truly loves her. His words made her heart a flutter, but she immediately checked herself. His memory loss is just muddling his emotions. The next morning, things were a bit awkward and she can't even face a slon properly. Wanting to avoid him, she decided to get the newspaper from Hans when he came, only to get scolded by a slon for rushing outside without so much as a rap. When she tried to argue, he cited that she had a cold not too long ago. She was surprised to hear him remember her's cold. 
It was the very reason he got hurt in the first place, when she tried to confront him about it. All he said was he vaguely remembered hearing about it. Seeing Hans go all flirty with her, Aslan openly showed his displeasure and intimidated the man. Not wanting to believe that he is jealous, Leela shouted at Aslan, asking what does he think he's doing intimidating the poor local postman that way. Instead of being angry with her, he explained that he is jealous and that he wanted to show her that he is being serious with her. Exasperated she just exclaimed that he is different from the Aslan she once knew. He asked her about his previous demeanor and she talked about his kindness, generosity, compassion, but he was never that open when it comes to romantic notions. He told her that she's been misled, all his past actions were just for show in order to win her favor, he then asked her if she was disappointed. She said no, she will always think of him as a good person, because to make an effort to make a good impression on the person one likes is a kind act, it stems from the thoughtfulness and respect one has for the cherished person. In response, Aslan teased her that she finally acknowledged he has feelings for her. She fled from him and went back inside the house. Rosalind is confronting Glock with his ridiculous idea of making her a duchess. Aslan already abandoned her. But Glock disclosed Duke Thordal's secret. Helena Lairstein is not who she shows society. She is in fact Leela Violet, daughter of a commoner. The Duke might be a formidable foe, but Leela is still vulnerable if they blackmailed him about her name and threaten him that they'll disclose her real identity to society. He'll owe anything they ask of him just to protect his wife whom he cherishes a lot. On a bright sunny day, Leela was dressed in normal clothes and was about to head out. When Aslan saw her, he asked if he could come, even though she told him that it would be boring. He still insisted on coming with her. Persuaded, they went out, with the duke dressed down in commoner garb, still people regarded him, his noble demeanor still oozing even when he's dressed so simply. Reaching the church where she teaches language to children, they immediately flocked around her and asked about the stranger with her, she told them he a guest staying at their house. Aslan watched her as she went on her lecture. From that moment, he completely regained his memories. The overlapping fragments are now clear. The dreams are not dreams of the future. Those are memories from his past life. The woman in his dreams and the woman in front of him is the same woman he loved in the past and in the present. Leela Violet. Meanwhile in the capital, Glock started to move. He approached a duke's rival in business, the Mechet Company. Its owner is the mastermind behind Duke Aslan Thorndal's assault. Swamped with worry, the owner of the Mechet Company was wondering why Duke Thorndal hasn't made his move yet. It was when Glock knocked on his door and offered a proposal. Using the allure of owning the Thorndal Railways, he devised a plan to get rid of the duke together with the owner of the Mechet Company. At the Amber House, Rosalind was contemplating whether she should continue to side with Glock or not. The latter took a better hold of her and decided to extricate herself from the situation. She started to write a letter. In the load, Leela's lecture just finished and the kids were requesting an outing at the beach. Since she is not a full-pledged teacher, she asked the priest of the church for consent. The priest acceded and they all went out to enjoy the beach. It started getting hot and Leela decided to rest by the available blanket they brought with them. Aslan approached her for water since his throat is parched from all the play he did with the kids as she watched him gulp his water from the bottle. A scene that made her heart race suddenly popped from a distant memory, and as he sat beside her and held her hand, she wondered if he's feeling the same warm and fuzzy feeling she feels inside. Staring at each other's eyes, they almost shared a kiss if not for one of her students calling out to her. After that heart-pounding moment, Leela can't seem to get it out of her head, devilish thoughts kept pestering her urging her to pursue a romantic relationship with Aslan. But, she knew better. Aslan only likes her at present. Because of his memory loss, he deserves to love someone who is well suited for him. Doing her best to escape such thoughts, she made the lame excuse of borrowing books from the vicarage. She ended up in town, and seeing a friend, she noticed there were more people than usual and asked about it. Her friend told her it was because of the festival.
Returning home, she heard her family making plans to go to the festival. They ended up making plans to go with the Duke. That afternoon, as he was feeling warm from the family that welcomed him as their own, a letter arrived for him. It was Rosalind asking to meet him. His mood turned a full 180. Displeasure was visible on his face. His servant suggested that he send a representative, but the Duke declined. The woman blatantly lied and shamelessly tried to steal away Leela's position as his wife. He won't let her get away that easily. The day of the festival came. Leela's mother made efforts to doll her up. The result was surprising. It was not as glamorous as the makeup done in the capital, but it sent out her maidenly glow and beauty. As they were roaming around the festival, she noticed quite a few things but held back from buying them. She doesn't want to burden her family with unnecessary expenses. But as they were meeting up to regroup, she noticed that Aslan bought everything that she landed her eyes on. Her parents then said their goodbyes and bid them a pleasant night. They will go ahead first and they can enjoy the rest of the festival. They even dragged Aiden with them to give Aslan and her time to be together. Seeing as most of the couples were dancing by the bonfire, Aslan asked her for a dance. She agreed and they enjoyed a freeform dance. At the capital, Rosalind was flooded with worry. She is not receiving any reply from the letters she sent to Aslan. Suddenly, the door of the house opened and in came Glock. Everything is in place. They just needed the Duke with all his memories. However, if he hasn't completely regained all of them, the plan won't work. Thus, Glock set out a plan to speed up the Duke's memory retrieval. Meanwhile at the festival in Elod, Leela was taking a rest at one of the benches. Her foot is aching, but she had so much fun. As she was enjoying the cool night air, a passerby suddenly dropped a handkerchief. She noticed the item and called out the attention of the owner. It was a noble man. He was grateful for her kind gesture and started to open small talk, only to be intercepted by the Duke, he immediately left after encountering the Duke's intimidating aura. He turned to Leela and scolded her for having the habit of picking up handkerchiefs. Leela then suspected that Aslan has fully regained his memories, but he denied it. Left with nothing to say, Leela turned around to go home, only to trip. Fortunately, Aslan was quick to assist her, noticing a limp in her gait. He asked to see her foot, what she considered a simple abrasion, turned out a serious one that needed doctor's treatment. Not wanting to aggravate her wounds any further, he carried her bridal style as they went to see a doctor. The nobleman whose handkerchief Leela picked was watching not far from them, as expected. Since she's beautiful, she has a lover. Feeling regretful, the man turned to leave, only to find himself being dragged by someone from the shadows of the alley of which he stood watching the couple. 